message from the Department of Defense. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. A sick nation broken in half by the hippies in the 60s. Take a look at the garbage running for office now. Take a look at the bowling pin in a pair of pantsuits. The hidden woman. The bowling pin wants to be president on one side. You got the race hater in the White House every day now giving a speech, turning black against white, white against black, black against Asian, Asian against black. Every day in every way, the same rotten, stinking people running the world. Again, Obama gave a speech. A sense of unfairness and powerlessness has contributed to dysfunction in black communities. Now, we have another story that I have to talk about. I've still not seen any photographs or video, even B-roll, of the so-called killing of Abu Sayyaf, the key ISIS figure, killed in the daring U.S. raid by Delta forces, where all of our troops returned safely. They even captured his wife, and they captured heavy intelligence. I'd like to believe it's true, but given that Obama's a liar, and given that this report about this special operations uh, uh, raid in eastern Syria overnight Friday to Saturday came after they took another city, I think it's just as likely to be Capricorn 1 and propaganda. I hope I'm wrong. But what good did it do? They took him. Let's say they did take him. The next day, the next city fell. And here's another question about the so-called war being run by the golfer moron in the White House, Satan. Are you ready for this one? The victory parade after they took Ramadi. I'm talking about ISIS. A column a half a mile long of their pickup trucks with machine guns. One A-10 could have wrecked the entire column, destroyed them. One sortie by one airplane could have wiped out the entire column. Why the hell didn't Obama launch that A-10? Because they're on our side. I am telling you right now that this is the biggest scam in your life. There's no explanation for this. And further proof to my suspicion that ISIS is actually being funded by the United States government is this. Do you remember last week the Pentagon asked the media to scrap old footage of ISIS columns? Did you hear this? Do you remember what they said? Pentagon spokesmouth Colonel Stephen Warren said, please stop using stock footage that makes the terror army seem more mobile and more formidable than they say it actually is. He said they don't travel like that anymore. And he said, quote, one Toyota speeding down the road by itself at night with his headlights off would be a more accurate image. Really, Mr. Spokesman Colonel Stephen Warren, yesterday I saw a column of Toyotas a half a mile long, and you and your brave air boys did nothing. They were told to stand down the same way they were told to stand down at Benghazi by the... <clears throat> I don't know. I can't say it. I really would like to say what I don't understand how the Republicans let them get away with it. The answer is because they're the same. Don't you understand there is no Republican Party? There's no Democrat Party? Don't you understand yet that it's a single block of a ruling class, and we're the moron serfs. And it's so bad that if my suspicion is correct, that ISIS is an arm of the United States government, in other words, a proxy army, that we, the citizens of this country, by permitting the charlatan in the White House to get away with this charade of a war against ISIS, we are responsible for the kidnappings, we're responsible for the rapes of children. We're responsible for the slavery of non-Muslims. We are the devil themselves for letting this character get away with it without demanding more. Now, of course, you say, what can I do? I understand that. You saw that George Staphylococcus is nothing but a paid whore. We understood that from day one. Did he ever look like anything but a paid whore? I mean, you're shocked that he's a paid whore and gave money to the Clinton Foundation? You're shocked that George Stephanopoulos looks like a male escort? He's been a male escort of the uh, Democrat Party from the day he started. He never was a journalist. Never. He's always been a pretty boy uh, escort for the Democrat Party. We have now in America what I've said for 10 years. We have reporters who suddenly call themselves journalists who are nothing more than fifth columnists disguised as members of the fourth estate. We have no fourth estate. 
I am the fourth estate. Drudge is the fourth estate. About 10 websites of the fourth estate. That's it. There is no fourth estate. Do you know what the fourth estate is? Okay, it's the fourth estate. We're supposed to stick our fingers into the side of the liars in government. We're supposed to be those who keep them in line. We're supposed to be the burr in the saddle of ABC, CBS, NBC, and the NYT. But when we become the same as them and we're not the burr in the saddle, what are we? Prostitutes. And so, therefore, I say to you, going back, circling back to my first story, on the headline, we were told over the weekend that the great Delta Force uh, killed a key ISIS figure, Abu Sayyaf, and then they captured his wife and great intelligence, and all the Delta Forces came home without a scratch on their shiny badges. Well, I hope it's true, but we haven't seen one picture yet. Now, if it is true and we haven't seen one picture yet, the only re reason is is because Harvey Weinstein is still in con. He's probably on a yacht enjoying an after party from the film festival, and he hasn't gotten back to make the movie yet to show it f uh, to show us Capricorn Two, uh, produced by Obama Inc., the new worldwide uh, dictatorship that's emerging. So that's a, a subject I want to talk about. There are others, by the way. I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We got the first report of sales of Countdown to Mecca, and despite my pessimism, they were really great. They were phenomenal. They were big. Now, it may not appear on the New York Times bestseller list Sunday for one reason. There may be books that sold less than mine that will because they've rigged the system now uh, so that they can select books that they don't want to keep them off the list by saying, well, we're doing the list to show a balance of major bookstores, independent bookstores. In other words, they can make up the list. So if you don't see Countdown to Mecca on the New York Times list, it's not because you didn't buy it in order to support the message. The book sold very well, by the way, and let's hope it continues next week. So those are two topics. Now here's a third one, medical marijuana. As you know, I totally oppose the dangers of marijuana from the point of so social and recreational use. It's a toxic poison. And I'm gonna say something today that you may not expect. If I was asked to legalize the drug, I would be totally against it. I am totally against people going to jail for using weed. That's number one. But I would vote against legalization because of its effects on young minds. It destroys their minds. However, having said that, I'm totally in favor of the medical use of marijuana based on all the evidence that I have read. And as I was researching the subject last night for whatever the reason was, I stumbled upon the fact that one of the geniuses of this field, Raphael Meshulam, of Hebrew University was the man who in 1963 elucidated the structure of uh, cannab cannabid cannabidiol, I thought it was THC, an important component of marijuana. And he was the one back in 63 who found out the active principle of marijuana was CBD. And this is an interesting side note. The same Raphael Meshulam, who is now 84 years old, is a genius, an Israeli scientist at, at uh, Hebrew University, offered me a fellowship in 1978 at Hebrew University because I was an expert in medicinal plants. He was an expert in pharmacology, and uh, he wanted me to come to Israel, but he said, I warn you, I can only give you a grant uh, for two years, after which time you're not going to have any income here in Israel. And he said this to me. I'll never forget it. He said, I'd rather you not come here. He said, as brilliant as you are, I'd love to have you in my department. He said, because it's men like you who cause revolutions. <laughs> I swear, it's a true story. Don't believe me if you don't want to. I, I left Israel within a few days because I ended it up. I didn't want to strand my family uh, in Israel after two years of a, of a fellowship. And I was driven there because America was not funding my kind of research, which was 30 years ahead of its time. And as a result, I'm on the radio. So I'm going to talk about marijuana today and the medical uses of marijuana. And I want you to understand something. There are many legitimate medical uses of weed. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? But that's not the same thing as using the guise of medical marijuana to sell it to people to get high. Getting high dumbs the population down even further than they're already stupid. Number two, it destroys young brains. Number three, to disguise yourself as someone who is sick through a shyster doctor is really disgusting. It weakens the entire medical system. So we're going to talk about medical marijuana, the real usage. 
We're going to talk about Hillary Clinton, the bowling pin with a pants suit who wants to be president. It's astounding to me that she's gotten this far, given the fact that she's a complete liar. She caused Benghazi to happen. She's all around bad, all around bad news. I don't believe she can win. And the reason the Dems and New York Times are turning on her is not because they don't like her. They're turning on her because they want someone more to the left than her to run for the presidency. You may not understand this. You may look back and see if Elizabeth Warren, Focahontas, wins the presidency, that maniac. If that maniac wins, God forbid, given the fact that the Republicans have almost no one running uh, of any note. If that maniac wins, you look back and say, I wish that Hillary had won. You see, you don't understand something here. We have a choice between two evil devils. If we only had a Republican nationalist running who got up once and said borders, language, and culture, who got up and said English is the language of the land. When I'm president, I'm going to make it the official language. If you don't like it, then get out of the country. If he got up and said, I'm closing the borders, I'm putting the National Guard on the borders with Mexico, I'm closing the superhighways to Mexico, I'm ending a trade status with China, they're not getting it. Borders, language, culture. And he reaffirmed the culture of America. And tell us what the culture of America is. That man would win by a landslide. Can you name one Republican who's done that? No. And that's why I'm afraid that it's liable to be someone like uh, Focahontas or this guy O'Malley. Now, I don't know where they got him from all of a sudden. What, he looks good in a bathing suit now all of a sudden? So he's, he's a presidential material? Just because he's white and he's got an Irish name? You don't think he's capable of being a far-left radical? He is. Don't you understand that his politics are far-left radicalism? Okay, so that's the opening to the show. If you care to comment on any of this, marijuana, is ISIS really working for the United States surreptitiously? Do you believe the U.S. Army Delta Force really killed the ISIS leader? Uh, your experiences with Countdown to Mecca in the bookstores, Hillary Clinton, and more to come right here. Now, I want you, before you take a break, go out playing Bob Dylan, the one we were going to play coming in that I changed at the last minute, because I like Bob Dylan as well, but I decided to go the other way. You know what I'm saying? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Everything we've done over the past six years, whether it's rescuing the economy or reforming our schools or Satan is retooling speaking. our job training programs, has been in pursuit of one goal. To destroy America. opportunity for all of us. To destroy the country. Kids. But we know that some communities have the odds stacked against them mm. and have had the odds stacked against them for a very long time, in some cases for decades. Now, he, of course, uses the word some communities, meaning the black communities, had the odds stacked against them for a very long time. So it begs the question of how did Obama, Holder, Sharpton and other African Americans who had the odds stacked against them get where they are. We have a black president. We had a black attorney general. We now have another black attorney general. We have Al Sharpton, the gangster criminal, in my opinion, uh, going in and out of the White House, holding people up uh, financially anywhere he can. Uh, he had the odds stacked against them. How'd they get where they are? In other words, if the communities have the odds stacked against them, uh, Obama didn't burn a city down. He's trying to burn America down. Holder didn't have to burn down a convenience store to rob a cigarette, a pack of cigarettes. Instead, he's trying to destroy the American police departments across America. Sharpton did a very good job living off the, the NYPD for at least 40 years now with that vermin lawyer of his. That, uh, so let's go to clip three and listen to the, to the Satanistic dialogues, the Satan's dialogues in three. And in some communities, that sense of unfairness and powerlessness has contributed mm. to dysfunction in those communities full of crap you know communities are like are like bodies and 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 if if their the immunity system's down they can get sick yeah that's and what you're doing to america communities aren't vibrant where people don't feel a sense of hope and opportunity oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and a lot of times that can fuel crime and that can fuel unrest well it didn't affect you you became president aren't you a member of that community holder was a member of the african-american community Everyone's a, a brother. Everyone loves each other. Of course, black on black violence is not caused by blacks hurting blacks. That's caused by someone outside the community pulling that trigger. You understand that? I mean, you've got to be serious about that. So then he goes on and justifies the thugs burning down Baltimore, 
burning down Var- Ferguson, destroying property in New York City. Listen to clip four. Listen to this. Listen to the evil in this tongue. We've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson and New York, and it has many causes from a basic lack of opportunity. You liar, to some groups you. feeling unfairly targeted by. Oh, shame on you. And that means there's no single solution. Yes, there, there is. Have to be throwing a you out of office. Solutions and different approaches that we try. There's only one solution, which is to get the devil out of the White House and have him stop attacking the police and stop supporting the thugs. Okay, I like to hear the applause. What a phony. While ISIS was on a rampage into Ramadi, this character liar Satan was golfing. ISIS held a massive parade in West Anbar Providence, province celebrating a victory in Ramadi. It went for a half a mile long. Do you remember under Bush we saw a highway of death? Where was one U.S. warplane? Why did the great commander-in-chief not launch an air attack against the ISIS parade of Toyota trucks with machine guns after they took the city before they started their pillaging, raping, and kidnapping? There's only one answer to this. And do you know what the answer is? They're working for Obama. They're working for the U.S. government. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Tell me why the U.S. Air Force was not instructed by the golfer to take out that parade. One warplane could have done it. One A-10 Warthog could have done it. And by the way, your, your golfer-in-chief has been trying to destroy the Warthog program for over two years. Ask him why. Ask the double-talking Satan why. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. If we as a society aren't willing to deal honestly with issues of race, then we can't just expect police departments to solve these problems. If communities are being isolated and segregated without opportunity and without you investment, are. can you and take any more of him? Look, the deck is still stacked in favor of those at the top. We know that. And so we have that. to be especially focused on how we're going to bring about the changes that Another will liar. ignite opportunity for yeah, everybody we, willing to work hard for it. We have two of the worst people in the history of the world, you just heard, a double whammy. You've got a race hater, a divider, a, I don't know what words to use for Obama, that at a time like this, after he burned down Ferguson, burned down half of Baltimore, set New York on its heels, he goes back and instead of saying, I'm sorry for what I did, he doubles down and he does it again. Again, he's trying to incite violence. Then you have the bowling pin in a pantsuit, the liar of liars, the head of the, uh, the, the, the uh, I don't know what to call it, Imelda Marcos of American politics. That would be a mild statement. It's beyond comprehension that this liar, with all the money they've made, says the deck is still stacked in favor of those at the top, as though we're, we're so dumb. We don't know about the billions of dollars that have been poured into the Clintong uh, uh, scam. We know nothing about the amount of money she made giving speeches. The deck is still stacked in favor of those at the top. So what is she doing? Again, she's using divide and conquer, appealing to the lowest, most base elements of society. She's trying to turn the masses against the middle class. Make no mistake about it. Warren Buffett's not going to be touched by any kind of revolution or riot. It's you. It's the middle class. That's who Bolsheviks have always targeted, the bourgeoisie, the middle class. That's who Obama's targeting in the burn baby burn campaign. Credit to Stokely Carmichael for that phrase. Nothing new from the 60s. It's as though the 60s came back and Stokely Carmichael is president. And he's saying, burn, baby, burn, you deserve it. And now waiting in the wings is this one, this creature. Okay, let's go to some of the callers. Line 5, WABC, Paul, go ahead. What's the uh, topic tonight? Thank you, sir. Uh, with uh, medical marijuana usage, uh, just making the point of uh, they, they want to make it sound like that, that's one of the worst things out there, but yet the two legal things that I believe in my experience are ten times worse, but those are legal, which is cigarettes and alcohol. Did you, hear, did you hear a word I said? Why are you coming up with this f- facetious argument? Did you hear me say that I'm in favor of using 
ingredients for marijuana for medical purposes, but not for recreational use because it is very dangerous for recreational use? Can you separate recreational use from medical use? Are you able to do that? The, the carcinogen intake, yeah, from recreational use is much higher from just the medical. That's what my point was. is that the car- oh, That's right. That's right. Marijuana, when you smoke it, is carcinogenic. It has more toxins in it than does tobacco smoke. That's number one. But the damage to young minds is what I'm concerned about. The enslavement of an entire generation who getting getting high on this drug who makes them even more immune to reality, more immune to what the devil is doing in the White House, more immune to what ISIS is doing around the world, more immune to reality. They don't know whether they're coming or going. They don't know what world they're living in. They're stoned all the time. Don't you understand what being stoned means? Yeah, I was talking more on, on a gateway uh, platform, the cigarette. All right, well, all right, well, look, what's the point? Uh, I, I don't even know what he's saying. I, now he was agreeing with me after disagreeing with me. You know, I wish he put down a joint. I'm glad he's listening. 855-407-282. WBAP in Dallas, great station, love it. Ben on WBAP Dallas, go ahead, what's on your mind? Hey, uh, Dr. Savage, I got your book count down the Mecca, but... See, I went, I went to the bookstore today. I got it last week, but it's still not on the shelf. Where? In Barnes & Noble? But it's, uh, it's selling like crazy in Barnes & Noble. But that's the thing. I had to go. The clerk had to go to the back to get it for me. I thought, okay, it's the first day. Oh, okay. So it's one of those green-haired, uh, you know, rings on the nose kind. They put the books in the back when they're supposed to put them on the front table. I get it. That's the thing. I think there's yeah. a boycott. I, I know. The, the, same, the sayings of Chairman uh, uh, Malbama are in the front. Uh, a Woman's Guide to Pantsuits by Hillary Clinton uh, is up front. Consider this. I think it might be you, the so-called Murdoch cartel because they got the Clinton cash book, they got Bill O'Reilly, they got Charles Krauthammer, but they don't have your book. What can I do? They're part of the establishment. I mean, O'Reilly and uh, Sauerkraut and, and the others are all part of the, uh, you know, the same cartel. They're part of the establishment. I mean, I wish them luck. People like them. That's very good, but there's no reason for them to bury a countdown to Mecca. It's selling. It's sold very well somewhere. I thank you for looking. 855-407-282. What do you want to talk about? Uh, WMAL, Washington, D.C. Doug, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? How you doing, doctor? Uh, Mike, just a general question. The Arabs in the Middle East, that, like the Saudis, who say they're against ISIS, why don't they all form a coalition and attack ISIS themselves. They could have bombed that parade just as easy as the United States Air Force could have done it. Why don't they... Well, it's an interesting question. ISIS has a half-mile parade of their Toyota trucks with machine guns after they storm into Ramadi. The Saudis are fighting them. The Jordanians are fighting them without any of our help. We have warplanes there. We have aircraft carriers in the area. We have cruise missiles. We have ICBMs. We did nothing. The Arabs did nothing. I don't know the answer to this. I'm bewildered. Saudi Arabia is threatened by them. Why are they doing nothing? That's well, I, you know, see, you have to look at tribal warfare. The Sunni, the uh, ISIS is a Sunni-led uh, group. You understand that, correct? Yes, I understand that. Now, it's very hard for us to understand the difference between the Sunnis and the Shmunis and the Shia. Who can remember this garbage? It's based upon a thousand-year-old feud. Between the Arabs. That's how advanced they are as a civilization. They gave us the zero and no one heard from them since. So now now they're fighting over something that occurred in the 11th century. A descendants of Muhammad as opposed to descendants not of Muhammad directly, but of his nephew. Then they've been killing each other for 800 years because of whether they're descended from Muhammad or his nephew. That's Sunni and Shia, fundamentally. Okay, so the, the ISIS murderers are basically their Saddam Hussein's army reformed. Let's be, let make it very simple. I saw this from the beginning. The very same army that our troops died to control have now reformed with our equipment that was left behind. That's the Sunnis. Now, the Saudis are a Sunni government. So why would they be afraid of ISIS? Well, they are afraid that they'll come into uh, Saudi Arabia and topple the royal family and have a revolution of the poor people uh, along the lines of what Obama wants here. And so they're playing it both ways, the Saudis. They could have taken on that, that column. So maybe they wanted them to take Ramadi. And then what? I thought they were fighting ISIS. I don't understand it. 
Moreover, let me ask you this question. Here's another one. Iran, Shia, okay? ISIS, Sunni. Obama's backing Iran, giving them the power to build a nuclear weapon to take down Israel and God knows who else. That's the Shias in Iran. ISIS is Sunni, uh, are Sunni Arabs. They just took Ramadi. We didn't fire a shot at their convoys. So now what? This country's on the side both of the Iranian Shia and the ISIS Sunni. Why? Well, you can say it's a grand strategy of the college girls who are running the country who think that by turning them against each other, we won't have to do the job. Basically, they're racist. They want the Arabs to kill each other. That would be the best scenario, but I don't believe it. I think it's cowardice and incompetence running the country. I think that they're running from Peter to Paul, sticking their finger in the dike, not knowing how to stop the water from flooding in. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And every day is a new experience for the college sorority that has wrecked this nation. And then you have Satan in the White House. You have an absolute fork-tongued Satan every day in every way, trying to bring the country to its knees, trying to turn black against white, white against black, Americans against the police. Every day Satan does it. Not a word from the pimps in the fourth estate, who are nothing but the fifth column. Not a word from the pretty boy, Stephanopoulos and his fellow travelers. Not a word from the prostitutes in the media about what this man is trying to do to, to, to burn another city to the ground. Don't you understand my rage? What do you think animates me to get up every morning and do this show? I see the country on fire. I see the man with the matches and the lighter fuel, and I see him playing with the lighter fuel and the matches every day, and I'm standing here like a fireman screaming fire in the theater. Get the child out of the White House. He's going to set the nation on fire like he set the world on fire. Stop him before he kills all of us. That's my opinion. And if you think I'm paranoid, then you're really sick, or you're stoned on medical marijuana, and you don't know what the hell you're doing yourself. Pardon me for using the word hell twice. I don't know if that's one of the seven deadly uh, words. Is it? I'm allowed to use it? I'm allowed to use I don't generally curse, and I don't use the word hell. So th these are the topics that are animating me. I mean, I'm very an animated. I mean, I have a stake in this nation. I've spent many decades in this country building a life for myself and my family. I have a grandchild, and I see Satan trying to set the country on fire. You think I'm the only one? You think I, Michael Savage, am the only one seeing Satan playing with matches and lighter fuel? You didn't hear his speech attacking again the police and justifying the thugs who robbed and uh, burnt Baltimore and Ferguson based on a, a false lie? Do you understand there's a race war brewing? Do you understand that that's part of his grand strategy for the 2016 election, which is to animate the thugs and get them not only to vote but to intimidate you away from the polls? You didn't see the second part of that. Not only to get the gangs to vote, but to get them to frighten you to not vote in your own city, to keep you away from the polls. That's his grand strategy for stealing America in 2016 and giving it to the bowling pin. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Uh, fake controversy. Here it is. Duke University condemns professor for noxious comments about blacks and Asians. And what did he actually say? Duke University has condemned Professor Jerry Hoff following students' backlash for noxious and offensive comments he posted online about blacks and Asians. Let's hear the comments and see if they're noxious. In the comments section of a New York Times editorial about racism in the Baltimore riots, Professor Hoff argued that blacks make little effort to integrate into society and that Asians, hurt, quote, work doubly hard to overcome racism instead of blame it for their plight. Here's what he said. Quote, every Asian student has a very simple old American first name, that symbolizes their desire for integration. He wrote on May 10th, quote, virtually every black has a strange new name that symbolizes their lack of desire for integration, close quote. In 1965, the Asians were discriminated against as least as badly as blacks. That was reflected in the word colored. The racism against what even Eleanor Roosevelt called the yellow races was at least as bad, Professor Hoff continued, quote, 
So where are the editorials that say racism doomed the Asian Americans? They didn't feel sorry for themselves, but worked doubly hard, close quote. So immediately the racist students that never should have been let into the campus, their dumbbells from the top to the bottom, the, these progressives, right away they got their uh, ire up, they got the chip on their shoulder, and oh, oh, started marching, screaming he should be fired. Get rid of the professor! Get him out of here! That 80-year-old noxious man! And right away the uh, losers in administration took the side of the uh, stupid students, Duke University president for public affairs uh, and government affairs, Michael Schoenfeld, said, Duke has a deeply held commitment to inclusiveness, grounded in respect for all, and we encourage our... Ah, come on. Yeah, respect for all, my eye. In response to this, Professor Hoff, who was in his 80s, didn't back off. He blasted political correctness and argued that society owes it to the black community to speak in frank terms. Here's what he said. Quote, I am strongly against the obsession with sensitivity. The more we have emphasized sensitivity in recent years, the worse race relations have become. I think that is not an accident. Quote, I know that the 60 years since the Montgomery bus boycott is a long time and things must be changed. The Japanese and other Asians did not, did not obsess with the concentration camps and the fact they were linked with blacks as colored. They pushed ahead and achieved. Coach K did not obsess with all the Polish jokes about Polish stupidity. He pushed ahead and achieved. And by his achievement and visibility, has played a huge role in destroying stereotypes about Poles. Many blacks have done that, too. But no one says they have done as well on the average as the Asians, close quote. Then he goes on. In my opinion, the time has come to stop talking incessantly about race relations in general terms, as the president and activists have advocated, but talk about how the Asians and Poles got ahead and to copy their approach. I don't see why that is insensitive or racist, he said. The university, of course, attacked him. And he kept going on because he's been around long enough to put up with the Lilliputians. He knows what the Lilliputians are, and he's not afraid of them. Lilliputian, write it down. Send it to Media Matters, controlled by George Soros and Hillary Clinton. You're reading a lot about Media Matters, aren't you, and Hillary Clinton, right? Well, I was a, a subject of Media Matters false attacks for years now. They've cost me a fortune in advertisers who were afraid of my show. It's all come out of the Hillary Clinton machine, funded by George Soros, funded by the Clinton crime family, uh, funded by uh, them, Media Matters, is a hit piece, a hit machine of the Hillary Clinton crime family that is used strictly to silence their enemies. If you want to live in that kind of country, count me out. I never aspired to live in the Soviet Union. If you aspire to live in the Soviet Union, let me know about it. I'll send you a one-way ticket to the Ukraine. 855 I can ask you a question. I'm going, you know, through the articles now, showing you what's out there. And the Duke professor, you can call about the uh, ISIS situation. Why have we not seen any pictures of the uh, key ISIS figure that they allegedly killed? Why no pictures? Is it propaganda? And uh, that's all, and life goes on. Meanwhile, Al Sharpton's daughter still goes on with a $5 million lawsuit for a sprained ankle, even though the New York Post got a picture of her on Instagram after climbing a mountain, saying she still suffers. You hear debilitating pain from the uh, twisted ankle. $5 million from New York City. I blame the lawyers for this. I don't blame Al Sharpton. I blame the vermin who run the legal profession. I blame the American Association of Trial Lawyers. The Trial Lawyers Association is the worst pox that has ever hit America. They are gangsters pure and simple criminals the tort machine is a criminal machine the lawyers are to blame for the downfall of america that includes the snake at the top join the savage nation call now 855-400-SAVAGE 855-400-7282 savage warning the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. We're going in, not in a handbasket, uh... We're going there on an express train, and the conductor's a maniac out of control. Welcome to the Savage Nation. 
We have a crazy man as a conductor of the, of the train of state, driving it as fast as he can, blowing the whistle, going through the stop signs, and screaming, race, 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 race. That's the problem. Meanwhile, the Middle East is burning. The bowling pin is waiting in the wings. And now the bowling pin, in order to appeal to the progressive left, which, as you know, progressive is the opposite of what they are. They're regressives. They want to take us back to 1917 in Russia. So when you hear progressive, think regressive. Think the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. Don't, don't fall for the rhetoric. Everything's backwards. Blue states should be red states. Red states should have been blue states. And progressive should be regressive. Here she says that she's now worried about the 26-year-olds who are aging out of Obamacare, they should be st allowed to stay on the system older than 26. Listen to this. You know, one of the problems, and I heard about this in Iowa, is what happens when a 26-year-old becomes a 27-year-old and is no longer eligible to be on his or her parents' policy. That was one of the best changes in the Affordable Care Act. And the fact is that a lot of young people aren't making the income they need yet to be able to afford their own health care. So we have to look out to see what we're going to be able to do to help them. And what would that be, Mrs. Clinton? Perhaps taking the money that you and your husband have garnered into the Clinton Foundation and dispersing it to people under 35, let's say, so they can buy health care? Or using it more for private jets and uh, yacht travel and fancy uh, mansions all over the world? What rubbish. It's the Bolshevik Revolution. Who's going to pay for it? Tell me who's going to pay for slackers who are staying at home who don't have a job or don't want a job, never will have a job, and they want to stay on, on a state-run on a state -run health care system, who is going to pay for it? Again, they're targeting the middle class. Again, they're targeting the bourgeoisie. Once again, they're targeting the middle class. Uh, once again, they're targeting what was known in the, in the Soviet era as the bourgeoisie. Nothing has changed under the sun. You have a hardcore class of Bolsheviks disguised as progressives, who want to bring about a revolution. They're a long way towards achieving it, by the way. Obama's taking them very, very far. If he is not stopped, he will achieve a full-scale full revolution in this nation before 2016. That's my opinion. We're also talking about medical marijuana. And let me make my position clear again in case you missed it, because I know a lot about the subject of natural products and uh, natural medicines. Those of you who know me, know that in 1972 I published my first book in the health field called Earth Medicine, Earth Food. It was followed by some other great books. One won the National Science Teachers Association Award for children's science books, Man's Useful Plants. Ba um, and towards late 70s I wrote Nutrition Against Aging. That was a, a good selling book. I wrote Maximum Immunity in 1983, which was in six or eight languages, published by Houghton Mifflin. I wrote uh, Reducing the Risk of Alzheimer's, where I was the first one in the popular literature to talk about antioxidants, slowing the aging of the brain, slowing the degeneration, really, of the, uh, of the amyloid plaques in 1981 or 82. It was a very, very important book that was hardly recognized at the time. And I worked in the field of ethnobotany for many years. And back in 78, I was thinking of emigrating out of America because I was a white male with a first-class PhD from the University of California. I was not hireable. I was also in a field that was too, let us say, remote from the stuck-in-the-mud stuck science of its day. So I looked around the world after being rejected by 200 universities, and in Israel, there was an advanced department in, in this field of medicinal plants being run by a man, a, a wonderful man named Raphael Meshulam. He offered me a two-year fellowship. I took my family there. I considered it, and I, I told you the long story. I, he told me that we could only give you a two-year fellowship after which you're going to be on your own, and there's very little money in Israel. And he said, I really don't think you should take it because men like you cause revolutions. I guess he saw that I looked like, uh, I don't know, just, I looked like a revolutionary. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I wasn't really a revolutionary. Nevertheless, I walked the streets of Tel Aviv that night, the cobblestone ancient streets of Tel Aviv alone, thinking about it. Should I move my family uh, to, the, to the city, the ancient city of Jerusalem? And I heard my deceased father's voice speak to me that night. And he said to me from heaven, I was an immigrant to America. It was very hard to be an immigrant to America. Do you want to make your children 
immigrants to another country where they don't even know the language. Packed the bags and went home the next day. That was my Israel experience, the last one. Because with children, you think more clearly. You start to think for them, not for yourself. It was only me. I had no family. I would have taken it for two years and figured, what the heck, I'll see what happens in two years. You know what I'm saying? You say, all right, I'll take it to you. I really want to do the research. And, and ironically, listen to this. He, he wanted me to work on the West Bank with the Arab communities on Ethnobot, and they probably would have had my throat cut and would have been disappeared <laughs> within the first three months. I mean, it was, pretty, it was pretty bad then as well. It wasn't as bad as it is today. But nevertheless, it was then. It was true. It was real. So I left. So then I learned that this very same brilliant scientist, Raphael Mashulam, is the man who isolated the active ingredient or the active principle, as we say, in marijuana, CBD, cannabidiol. I think it's cannabidiol, yes. I used to think it was THC. But he established the structure of CBD, which is an important component of marijuana. And CBD is widely used now in medicine and very effectively. It's a very important one. And so I'm totally in favor of using isolated components of marijuana for medicinal use. But I totally oppose legalization. I don't want people going to jail for using weed. I'd like to see it decriminalized. But I would not vote for legalization for one reason. It sends the wrong message to the youth. It destroys young brains. It's very dangerous. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Do you understand you can have it both ways? You can be for the use of marijuana components in medicine and against its use in, let us say, recreational areas. Social or recreational use is a poison. It's why we have so many dumb people. Why do you think it was called dope for so many years? Because it makes you stupid. It doesn't make you smarter. It makes you stupider. Have you found anyone who gets smarter on the marijuana? I offer you a challenge. I want you to sit down, if you can still write cursively, write a uh, 100 words in cursive. Just write 100 words from your own mind in, 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 in cursive uh, letters. Now smoke a joint and try to write 100 words in cursive letters. See what happens to your handwriting. You'll find out that it doesn't work very well for uh, left brain rational thinking. It may make you feel good if you have the mind of a one, one string banjo. But if you were gifted with a mind that's very complex with many strings, like a fine violin, all it does is wreck the violin. So I would say that for those with one string minds, go ahead, enjoy yourself. But it's very dangerous for the children. That's topic number 53,000 on the Savage Nation. 855 Andrew on WABC wants to chime in today on what topic? I don't know. Andrew, welcome to the program. What topic? I want to chime in on Asian people, affirmative action, and uh, that topic. I wanted to point out Asian people did not just achieve. Jewish people also, they surpassed the white majority that was not discriminated against. So they didn't just do well. They And the liberals will say, well, they weren't discriminated against like black people were, but they should only do better than the African-American community. Not only did they, they did better than all communities and i well the asians were discriminated against they were called the yellow peril during the early days of the 1900s uh there was a, an attempt to block the immigration of asians they were looked upon with contempt there were rules against the chinese in particular in this country the admissions committees of many universities were totally opposed to jews and asians by the way did you know that harvard had a low quota for jews and asians as late as the 1950s, did you know that? I did. In New York City, they discriminated against Jewish students. And I think the irony is that it actually emboldens the Jewish and the Asian families and helps them and hurts the black and Latino people. Well, I know the Jews didn't burn their city down out of protest. They worked harder. I, I know that the Asians didn't go and rob a 7-Eleven in the name of uh, prejudice. I know that. They did and I know, I know that no president on earth would call thugs and thieves and criminals uh, justified in their behavior unless they themselves have the same mentality or want to see the next city burn, baby burn. That's the whole point, is that when you have a man setting the, the nation on fire city by city, and I see this with my own eyes, justifying it every day, it's shocking to watch this. But I don't expect anything from the George Stephanopoli of the universe, do you? The one thing Obama will never say is what causes the uh, out-of-wedlock birth rate and why there's so many fathers. 
not in the homes, in the inner cities that he goes to. It's his policies that caused it. Asians, my wife came here from Thailand. Within four years, she was the best student in her school. She had to translate everything from Thai to English. She got straight A's. So they had Why is it that Indian people, who are dark-skinned, by the way, uh, who are subject, let's say, of a lot of prejudice, people think they're terrorists, they lumped them in with uh, radical Muslims, why do Indians come here and within a few months they're winning spelling bees? How does that work? I would go to Jersey City, New Jersey. There's an Indian, big Indian population and a big Latino population, and I would cover news stories. And the Indian teenagers are much you know, better, I'm just going to say it as it is, talk honestly about race. They're more studious, they're nerdier. You never see them toting around babies. They don't get pregnant when they're teens. The, the family is intact. And then well, these are very embarrassing facts, and I'm sure people are cringing listening to you because they're going to call you every name under the sun. Then they'll attack me for letting you say what everyone knows to be the truth. Everyone looks at this, and they're supposed to say, I don't see what I see. But why is this happening? That's the real question. Let's go backwards before the great society of Lyndon Baines Johnson, a demagogue of his time. A demagogue who single-handedly with a scythe destroyed the black family by creating the welfare state. He substituted the African-American father with the state father. They, did no, they no longer needed a breadwinner to receive money to sit at home and have babies. They had the state doing it. And what happened was businesses, there were once thousands, tens of thousands of small businesses in these African-American communities that literally disappeared in a few years because they were not needed any, they were not needed anymore. This has been well studied by sociologists over decades. The Great Society, meaning socialism, decimated the black family in the estimation of many dignified scholars. That's what we're saying, isn't it? Exactly. The black family was better. All right, so Obama's continuing this decimation of the black family by putting out the big lie. And he rolled back Clinton's Welfare Reform Act. Holder puts the crack dealers back on the streets. I saw the success in the inner city in Newark, New Jersey, when welfare was reformed, when there were mandatory drug sentences for drug dealers, not for kids with marijuana. Obama rolled that back. He's damaging. The black family was better than the white family in the Martin Luther King era. Only 11 percent out of wedlock until Obama and the big government got their hooks in them. Well, I'm glad that you know the truth. It's that simple. And Obama is using the same demagoguery to put out the big lie that the, the communities themselves are suffering without saying why they're suffering. I'm sending you a copy of my best-selling book, Countdown to Mecca, out last week. Sold very, very well the first week, despite the media blackout. I wasn't allowed on Fox News because of uh, the leprechaun and Martha Washington. They'll have a pimp on or a terrorist. They'll have a drug dealer on. Uh, they'll have any degenerate they can get their hands on for ratings, but they won't have uh, an American national treasure, Michael Savage, on because Martha Washington is afraid of competition. And I don't tell you, I have to tell you how thin-skinned uh, the leprechaun is. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. 855-400-7282. So Obama continues to attack the police and justify the thuggers who are burning down cities. Uh, and he gets away with it. And what's what's even more perplexing, not really perplexing, is that the police unions and the top brass are Democrats, by and large. Why? Because of the fact that they're invited to the White House. Number two, they get huge pensions, huge pensions. He then signs a law taking away some military equipment from police, which they need to protect themselves from machine gun toting gangs. At the same time, he militarizes the military by having them conduct exercises in uh, Texas, which are scaring the heck out of people. You know about that. You know about that. You didn't hear about that? Didn't make it to your local paper? Jade Helm exercises in Texas. U.S. Marines training to intern U.S. citizens. Didn't read about that. Didn't make it to your paper, eh? At the same time, the Satan is doing that. He is taking away military great equipment from the local police can you not see the connection 
You can't put two and two together? I can. 855-400-7282. Any topic is uh, fair game. Let's take a quick call right now. KSFO. Oh, no, I don't want to take KSFO. Oh, there it is. Gail on KSFO. Go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. Hi. First, thank you so much for talking about not legalizing recreational marijuana. That needs to be said. I thank you for that very much. But I'm calling because I'm uh, really supporting and behind Elizabeth Warren for the work she's trying to do for the middle class. And I guess well, when you call her... Well, well, hold it, hold it. She's known as a radical leftist. How does that jive with the middle class? Because she comes from the middle class and because she's trying to pass laws... And well, so did Karl Marx come from the middle class. So what does that have to do with anything? But what, what are her main points? What is she trying to achieve? She's trying to turn the trend away from building up corporate America into remembering the middle class. What does that mean by building up corporate America? Why is corporate America so evil? I don't understand this the whole bugaboo of the left. Corporate America is evil. Most of our country is run by corporations. What makes, corp what makes corporations inherently evil when they con consist mainly of people? What makes a corporation inherently evil? I don't understand it. Well, it's the only way that I could express what I'm... Well, express what? That anyone who's successful is no good? Don't you understand Elizabeth Warren feeds the rage against successful people, and all she's going to do is push race division, class warfare, and hatred. That's how she got where she is in the communist state of Massachusetts. Ask the people who know her what she stands for. I don't agree with you, my friend. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. So the Clinton cartel is trying to push the old lady uh, into the presidency, and even the left is uh, pissed off at her in plain English. They know she's a fraud and a, basically a money-grubbing creep who's out for himself and the fam herself and the family. So then they're pushing another woman, Elizabeth Warren, only because she's a woman, uh, a fanatical leftist. If you look at Elizabeth Warren positions, they're right out of any university play playbook. You look at the same crap we've heard for 30 years now. Renewable energy and energy effic efficiency. Get rid of coal. Get rid of old, dirty energy like oil and coal. Instead, move to green technology. In other words, kill the eagles with windmills and stuff the pockets of special interests with solar projects that produce not a kilowatt. So we've heard this before. It's been tried everywhere. It's not working. Now, we all want clean energy. I'd love to have a solar car. I'd love to have a cell on the roof of my house uh, where I didn't have to use PG&E. It's not here. It's not here. And so, sure, I believe in research, but don't destroy the industries that are providing cost-effective energy in order to get there. That's insanity, but that's the left again. That's the academic approach. Kill coal, kill oil, and don't have a replacement yet. And make sure that the gangsters make a fortune in alternative energy. Now, education. Again, she says, we need good public schools, good public universities, good technical training. Really? Well, we had that for a very long time in America. What happened to it? You want a little answer, Miss Warren? I'll give you an answer as a former educator. The schools were flooded with illegal immigrants who do not speak the language, and 25% or more of the school budgets were given to ESL, English as a second language, and so that the money that should have been spent on advancing the knowledge of native-speaking peoples is now being spent educating uh, illegal immigrants in speaking the rudiments of the language of the land. That's number one. There are also other special interests that have poached out or stolen the scarce resources of our schools. And I can list them for you because I'm, I'm an expert in educational spending. So don't tell me we need more educational spending. We actually need smarter educational spending. We need less money on affirmative action. We need less money on ethnic studies, less money on all of these special interest departments that shouldn't exist, no more bilingual education. And then you'll suddenly find out that we can have good schools again. And it doesn't require more money. It requires less money. So I disagree with her on that. Now we go to the next platform of the socialist Focahontas. Roads, water, and other infrastructure. Remember infrastructure last week with the, plane, uh, the, the train crash? Infrastructure? Well, it turns out nothing to do with infrastructure. But they want more money for road building. Why? Because all roads lead to the unions. Remember what you're listening to. Why do you think they want trillions of dollars now for infrastructure spending before Satan leaves the White House? 
because the unions will make trillions of dollars on the money that they steal from the middle class to rebuild the roads, the bridges, and the tunnels, which, by the way, may need rebuilding in many places. I didn't say the train crash was a, a result of that, but I did say last week that I don't know of a tunnel in a major city that isn't leaking. I don't know of a bridge across a major city that is not rusting. Okay? Research. They want more money for new research. Well, we could argue about that. Finally, she wants workers' rights. Now, listen to what she says, Elizabeth Warren. We need to make it easier for workers to want to organize together to have that chance. Unionization. The opposite of Reaganomics is Warrenomics. Warrenomics is a retrograde view of the economy. It didn't work. It won't work. It never will work. Then she wants free and fair trade, whatever that means. Trade laws. What does that mean? That the countries we compete with also respect workers' rights? Good luck, Elizabeth. Why don't you see if you can get your communist friends in China to agree with you on that? So the whole thing's uh, smoke and mirrors from Elizabeth Warren. And, of course, that's why she's been able to pull in some gullible people. They don't really analyze that it's been tried before and it doesn't work. 855 KKOB Radio. Mary, you're up on the Savage Nation. On which topic? Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I was calling because I, well, first of all, Dr. Savage, I think that you're very smart, and almost everything you say I agree with. So I was just calling about the marijuana, and I wanted to say that uh, when I was in high school, I would smoke marijuana before a test, and I would always do very well. But then when I didn't, I wouldn't do very well. So I'm not saying that it made me smarter. It just, I just got better grades, and I don't really know why. And and where where are you in life right now? Are you a successful professional or what? I am. I uh, the company that hired me sent me to Pepperdine University, and obviously working for a company, I couldn't smoke, but um, it was more difficult for me versus. So what? so you find marijuana gives you better concentration? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I do very well when I smoke it. Now, I don't smoke it anymore, but I had to kind of rationalize why did I do so well when I was younger. Well, so maybe you have a brain that reacts to some of the cannabinoids in, in a positive manner. But for a wholesale use, I totally oppose legalization. I would like to see it decriminalized. And I would like to see much more research done on the medicinal applications of various and sundry cannabinoids rather than wholesale people going out and using the, the, the doctor's prescription, the fake prescriptions that abound in America now just to get high, which is what it's all about. You've got shady doctors looking to make a buck. So you go into these clinics, you give them whatever, and then they say, you got this, you got that, you got headaches, you got arthritis, here's your prescription. You go to one of these shyster uh, drug dealers and uh, you're getting it, they're getting it to get high, which weakens a nation. I look at it, in this case, I look at it from a medical point of view and, frankly, a moral point of view. The nation is rotting. I cannot understand how this would strengthen a nation to have more people stoned rather than less people stoned. Moreover, marijuana is known to have deadly effects on developing brains. Uh, I don't know if you know any of that, but I appreciate you calling. I am sending you something to concentrate on over the weekend, my best-selling novel called Countdown to Mecca. I'm sure you'll find it a fun, fast read. It is the Savage Nation. I know every time I do the marijuana subject, I get tons of callers of people who defend marijuana. It's sort of an addiction itself. They immediately say, oh, you're just pushing alcohol. I haven't said that. You didn't hear me pushing alcohol. I'm trying to give you a rational scientific opinion on the cannabinoids for medical use as opposed to the recreational use. They're not the same thing. And uh, I can't seem to get that across to people. So let's go to the welfare issue. Or uh, let's go to a physician at KKOH in Reno. Joe, you've been holding. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Thank you, Dr. Savage. I wanted to talk about the uh, cannabis issue. Cannabinoids, and you had mentioned CBD, cannabidiol. This is an active cannabinoid. But THC is also a chemical that binds to cannabinoid receptors. THC. I'm sorry, Joe, you're breaking up. I would love to hear what you have to say, but you're in a very bad zone. Yes, yeah, CBD is a very important component of marijuana, and it is used extensively in medicine. And the godfather of this is a great, a great uh, scientist in Israel, Raphael Meshulam, who I told you about. His uh, father was a physician, a concentration camp survivor, 
and uh, he didn't come here complaining and crying about the concentration camps. In fact, they emigrated to Israel, where he later studied chemistry. And his first research experience in the Israeli army was working on insecticides. And from that, he went into medicinal chemistry and medicinal plants. And I had the honor of meeting him briefly in 1978. And he invited me to Israel, as I said, to work with him at Hebrew University. I still to this day wish I had done it. But I had a young family and I couldn't subject my children to being immigrants in a strange land, to be very honest with you. And here I am. So I'm on radio because I was blacklisted by the United States uh, uh, academic establishment because unfortunately I was born a white male at the wrong time. Uh, it's true that I had a, a first class PhD with a 3.94 index after two master's degrees and at that time I published six books. My master's thesis was published in its entirety in a university journal that was published by Harvard University. That means something to scholars to have your thesis published anywhere is almost rare, uh, impossible to believe today. But my thesis was published in its entirety in the Journal of Economic Botany at Harvard. And then I went on to another master's, then a PhD. You would think, hey, guy, this guy has some credentials. They would not touch me. 200 rejections. So here I am years later. I'm now their worst nightmare. I am now the liberals' worst nightmare. And this is where God wanted me. It's that simple. If God wanted me to be just another professor working in a laboratory, enjoying the, the beautiful life, of, by the way, of academia, if you're in the sciences and you can avoid the psychotics and the social sciences, which is almost impossible, because, they, you know, I can tell you, they took down one of the, America's greatest scientists 20 some odd years ago. Does the name Watson ring a bell to you? Well, it's of the great team, Watson and Crick, who, who, who first described the double helix. This was a great story. He was one of the great American scientists. He was the head of the Cold Spring Harbor Research Facility on Long Island. And again, a Nobel Prize winner. He uh, defined the double helix, which any educated American knows what that is. That's the structure of uh, DNA. And when I was a young kid in, in school, he was like a god. I mean, we looked up to him. God, he was a great guy. So then I find out that 20 years ago, he's the head of this laboratory in Long Island. And he's fired because he made one remark again about blacks that was insensitive. He made a remark about blacks and Jews that was not racist at all. He was stating fact from his point of view as a scientist. I don't remember the exact remarks, but they fired him, a Nobel Prize winner who was one of America's great national treasures. So in many ways, I think I was very lucky to not have uh, gotten a job in academia. I don't think I would have survived a year with the psychotic radical feminists, with the goon squads and all of these departments running around like red, red brigades, the Khmer Rouge, looking to root out anyone who says something that's not politically acceptable and firing professors who say the truth about anything. I don't think I would have lasted very long. So in many ways, it's been a long, hard road, but I wound up where I belong. I've been doing this for 21 years. You understand what I'm saying? I think sometimes there's a fate element involved in things. I can't always say it's true. I didn't want to be rejected by 200 universities with all the work I had done. I would rather have been a quiet professor, be left alone, to be frank with you. I would love to have gone on my research expeditions and had the faculty parties and, you know, the fun of the students, seeing them develop and all that. But I didn't have that. And I resented it for a very long time. And then I realized that it was not my life. It was not made for me. This is what was made for me. I was made for uh, the media. I was made for the radio. At the end of the day, if you ask me, Michael Savage, what I am, I'm not a scientist. I'm an educator. I realized that this morning. I actually thought about it. If you were to write your own autobiography, what would you define yourself as? I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. That's really what I am. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. We have a uh, breaking news story on the Savage Nation. Six Chinese nationals charged with stealing Silicon Valley trade secrets. Isn't diversity grand? Isn't inclusion wonderful? Three Chinese nationals who earned advanced degrees from the University of Southern California and three others have been charged with stealing wireless technology from a pair of U.S. companies. Federal prosecutors say Hao Zhang, Wei Pang, 
and Sui Zhang met at the university and conspired to steal technology from Skyworks Solutions, Inc. and Avago Technologies soon after graduating in 2006. And now you've heard the rest of the story about immigration and its wonderful advantages for America. Isn't it great to train people from other countries here in our best institutions, only to have so many of them turn around and stab us in the back? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great the way Zuckerberg and uh, Bill Gates want more H-1B visas so they can bring in more of these people, more of these third worlders to work, not for the American wage, but for, let us say, 60% of the American wage, couching it as diversity and inclusion. They are decimating the IT industry by firing American workers and bringing in cheaper workers from India, from Taiwan, from China, you name it, in order to save a few dollars. Is there no amount of money that Zuckerberg could have that would satisfy his lust? Is there no end to his greed? And the same with Mr. Gates. I know how wonderful he is and what a liberal icon he is. Is there no conscience left in Bill Gates' heart for the American worker he is displacing with third world workers with his calls for increased immigration, which is just deployed to lower costs? Is there no one left in the media to speak out for the IT workers other than me? 855-407-282 is the phone number. Let's shoot to a caller. James on WABC, fire away. Think you could be the last caller this hour. What's on your mind? Okay, thank you for taking my call. Um, I agree with you as far as the welfare system uh, creating a major problem in the African-American community. I'm African-American, but you were saying that the uh, Chinese come here, they do well. The uh, Indians come here, they do very well. And you pretty much pose the question, uh, what happened to the African-Americans? The, uh, if you look at Africans when they come here, they tend to do very well for themselves. That's true. I was going to actually say that. They do very well. The Africans who come here on their own volition, I think what you're saying is the African-American originally, the ancestor, did not come here on, on their own volition, right? That's correct. And also, if you look, the Chinese come here, they have a sense of their own culture, their name, their language, their folkways, their mores. African-Americans, uh, in order to be a slave... You had, to, you had to make a slave, and that's what Americans did. They made slaves. You had to be a dependent person. They created an entire race of people to be dependent on them. Uh, if you were a, a free-thinking person, a free man, a free woman, you wouldn't be dependent on no one. So when you look at the Africans, they come here, they become doctors, lawyers, engineers, etc. Same thing with the Indians. So um, I think that it's a self created So how, how do you fix the problem if it happened... 150 years ago. How do you fix an issue like that? Well, they, they look at child abuse. They say if you look at child abuse, uh, it's something that's been passed down generation after generation. No, I understand what you're saying. It's a rational argument to explain the difference between the general success rate of African Americans born here and African Africans born in Africa. Uh, but I don't understand how you solve the problem. How much can a society do after 100 and so, 150 years? What are we? What's next? I mean, we had... Uh, uh, we had all sorts of programs, and I don't think that justifying a person's inability to get ahead in a society based on racism is going to help them very much. I think it enslaves them somewhat. I think you need to tell people, look, you have suffered. There was a grave injustice to your ancestors, but by continuously talking about it to yourself, you're only digging your own hole. I don't know how, how else to put it. It's like Jews who are obsessed with the Holocaust. I want nothing to do with them. I don't want to walk around like like a like a victim myself. Does that make sense to you? Let me send you countdown to Mecca. We're out of time. I wish we could talk another hour. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, the Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. You think I'm going to kill myself over over the snake? You're wrong. I'll point out what the snake is doing. 
I'll continue to call him Satan until you wake up to the fact that he is. I will talk about the bowling pin until the end of time. But I got to tell you something. Living well is the best revenge. Welcome to the Savage Nation hour number three. And we've been playing sound of the snake in the White House stirring up hatred between the races again. I don't know how a young black male in this society who's gone to college and has a good job in the corporate world cannot understand that he's making their life much more uncomfortable. I don't understand it. I don't understand why there's no out or outcry in the, in the African-American community about this guy. He's setting the entire nation back 50 years, let alone the African-American population. The nation is being dragged back 50 years. And why is he doing it? You have to ask him, what is Obama and Michelle, what are they trying to do? Well, you have to understand they're Machiavellian. They got where they are by stirring the pot. They got where they are by using this technique. So why should they stop now? Do you think they want to walk away from Air Force One? Do you think Michelle wants to give up 72 private servants of her own? Do you think that they want to give up all the power in the world? You think they're going to let go easily? The answer is no. But since there is no longer a fourth estate, and since there is no longer an opposition party, I feel it's my obligation as a member of the fourth estate to not act like the fifth column, but to act as a member of the fourth estate and say it like it is. This is how I see it. This man does not stop stirring hatred between the races. This man does not stop encouraging ISIS from raging through the Middle East. And apparently he's getting away with it, so why should he stop now? On another front, it's a story that I covered at the end of hour two. Six Chinese nationals charged with stealing U.S. trade secrets. It's an interesting but boring story in a way. These characters earned advanced degrees from the University of Southern California. Then they try to steal technology from companies soon after graduating in 06. So today they're hit with an indictment by, uh, I, I think, by federal officials stealing U.S. technology. So they go to, they go to the uh, Chinese embassy in San Francisco. Listen to what they say. This is funny. I got to read it exactly. I thought it was in this article. They know nothing about it. Oh, <laughs> they never they didn't hear about it. They went to the, they asked the uh, the Chinese embassy in San Francisco what they have to say about it. They said they, they didn't hear anything. About, they know nothing about it. Uh, they don't, apparently don't read the U.S. newspapers. So they go into the businesses. They rip off the uh, information according to this indictment. And this indictment alleges that the three Chinese alums began plotting in late 06 to steal trade secrets from the U.S. companies where Hao Zhang and Wei Pang worked. Months after their graduation, Wei Pang sent an email to China discussing the trio's plan to use purloined U.S. trade secrets to set up a factory in China to manufacture technology that eliminates interference from wireless communications, according to the indictment. One of the crooks boasted in the same email that the technology is worth $1 billion a year in the phone market alone, according to the federal indictment. The indictment alleges that the Chinese stole recipes, source codes, specifications, presentations, design layouts, and other documents marked as confidential, close quote. Now, let's look down on this story a little bit. How did they get caught? This is very interesting. Hao Zhang and Wei Pang quit their U.S. jobs in the spring of 2009 to become professors at Tianjin University, a prestigious Chinese college 130 miles southeast of Beijing. The men work with administrators and a grad student to establish a Chinese company to make the technology. Listen to what happened. This is a U.S. company. Avago executives became suspicious of the Tianjin team when they saw Hao Zhang's patent applications for technology created by the company according to the indictment. Listen to the puzzle. Richard Ruby, Pang's former boss at the company Avago, went to a conference in China in late 01. Listen to how far back this goes and toured the new Tianjin lab created by the defendants, according to the indictment. During that tour, Richard Ruby recognized technology stolen from Avago and confronted Wei Pang and Zhang Pin Chen, a college dean. Pang and Chen denied stealing any technology, according to the indictment. What's amazing about the story is that this U.S. corporate guy saw this in 2001. And it's only now in 2015 that an indictment was brought against these Chinese nationals, charging them with stealing U.S. trade secrets. So you have to ask yourself, let's go back to 2001. 
Wasn't Bush president for eight years during this period? You betcha. Don't you think that people were trying to get the Bush administration to bring charges against these characters under Bush? You betcha. So why did it finally happen under Obama? I don't know. That's an interesting question, especially when Obama is right now trying to push a trade deal with China. It seems uh, counterintuitive to me that the very same administration would bring an indictment against Chinese nationals, which would alert Americans to the, uh, the, the wholesale theft of our technology that's going on without a trade uh, deal, which is going to make it much more easy for them to rob trade secrets, right? Okay, whatever. Let's go on. I think this, I, know, I know something about radio. Let me tell you a little secret. Trade stories are interesting, but they don't attract audience. They don't keep audience. Economic stories, they don't keep audience. They just don't. I know it from 21 years, but I found this an interesting story, so I brought it up in the middle of everything else, okay? WMAL, Randy, welcome to the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. What's on your mind? Well, thank you for taking my call, Mr. Savage. Uh, I'd want to talk to you here. You, you're, you always come up with the marijuana, it's the detriment of society and, and such, and I do have, have a problem with that. Uh, I've been on, smoking weed on and off for 30 years. And your brain and your brain is rotted. Excuse me. And your brain is rotted. I mean, you know, I can't accept that you're telling me that you've been smoking for thirty years. Therefore, you're now a scientist on the subject. What do you know about marijuana other than that you're a stoner? You don't know anything about it. How many people do you know? How many people? I know at least a hundred. Yes, there are. Right. You know other stoners who are potheads, and you think that that's a that's a that's a representative sample for a scientific statement. You don't know the first thing about it. It's well known in the communities that study these things that it has a very deleterious effect on developing minds, number one. And number two, you should know if you're so intelligent as a pothead that the, the, the smoke, marijuana smoke, is more toxic than cigarette smoke. Don't you know that? I don't know about more toxic. Uh, but I well, I do know about more toxic. You don't know anything about the science of the smoke. I do. And you know what? You don't have to be a genius. Just Google the toxins in marijuana smoke. It has more carcinogens than tobacco smoke. But go ahead. Kill your lungs. They're your lungs to kill. God gave you a pair of lungs. If you want to destroy them, be my guest. And if you want to walk around addled on marijuana and think that you're not destroying your capacity to think you're wrong. Again, I want to make it clear because your potheads just don't get it. You're so defensive about your drug that every time I try to distinguish between my approval in my mind of using various components of marijuana in medicine as opposed to recommending it for recreational use, you immediately jump in to defend marijuana for recreational use. I certainly will re repeat what I said two hours ago. I do not want people going to jail for using dope, but I would vote against it if it was to be legalized because it sends the wrong message to the children that it's as, you know, let us say as harmless as, uh, as, as oregano. It's a, just another spice. It isn't just another spice. It's a psychoactive spice that screws up your mind pretty good. And again, I certainly don't recommend it for recreational and medicinal, uh, excuse me, for recreational social use at all. I certainly do recommend various cannabinoids for medicinal use. That's what I was trying to tell you. But apparently no one heard me. 855 I forgot my number. 855. Let's go to the callers. Jade on WMAL, please uh, welcome to the Savage Nation. What topic is on your mind? Um, I, I just want to know why you continue to say that, you know, about slavery. Like, well, this was hundreds of years ago, and I don't understand these people. Blacks really, I mean, if, speaking from an African-American woman, if, if we just recently got over some of the most racist um times in in history in our era that wasn't that long ago for goodness sakes my grandmother's 60 years old really and how did Bar barack obama become president if it's such a racist nation yeah i'm not saying it's such a race how did eric holder become attorney general if it's such a racist nation how did loretta lynch ne replace him as attorney general if it's such an evil white racist nation you're not making any sense no i'm making perfect sense you keep yeah, to yourself because you're walking around with a sense of victimhood and what you want to do is have me you want to force me to reinforce your sense of being a victim. I won't do it. I'm not going to buy into your victimhood because I don't believe it. I'm educated. I work hard. Nobody's given me a thing. All right. So why do you walk around saying that you're a victim? 
I'm not saying that I'm a victim, but I do understand systemic racism. And I do understand. No, you don't. You've been brainwashed by the universities into believing that. So now you believe that Obama's right in saying that the city like Baltimore burned because of systemic racism? No city should burn. But I am saying that there is systemic racism that does exist. Really? And there's no racism running from the African-American community toward the white community? There's no racism running inside the African-American community against Asians? Are you kidding me? It's wrong on both sides. Well, I understand that. But you, you have to admit the level of racism inside your own community towards others. I mean, let's not pretend that you're separate from everybody else. You're also human beings like everybody else. And your, uh, your community is just as capable of racism as every other community. Absolutely, and I completely agree with that. And so I can't what? So okay, so we can agree that there are people who are going to be in the grievance industry, and all they do, in my opinion, is make the children. What they do is imprison the children. They don't liberate the children with that kind of rhetoric. Look at, but you don't look at any of the other statistics. Do you know that black graduation rate, rates for women? Have you looked at the? Are, are extremely high. We've come a long way. It was a. Well, hold on, so you so you now, but you now contradicting yourself you say your graduation rates are very high so where's the racism in that there isn't this is what i'm saying it's despite of but we're not all the way there yet it's getting better it's evolving but when so when will you be all the way there tell me what has to happen for you to be all the way there what has to what, what, what are the signals generations to stop the stale thinking that currently exists and we'll be there we're almost i know that. what do you mean by stale thinking what does that mean what has to give me practical methods of eliminating the grievance industry? Because once we can get people to be open minded and think a bit, a little bit more empathetically, except from their small world view, and 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 get the point, then we won't have. Well, it. you're not making any sense. What do you mean, think more empathetically? What do you want them to do? You, you, you're talking about thought crime now. Stop, stop saying what you were saying, which was that, oh, this happened hundreds of years ago, and we need to just get over it. It wasn't hundreds of years ago. It wasn't. There were black codes. There were Jim Crow laws. I mean, all kinds so, of But wh why is it that America was moving well along in race relations until this gangster came to the White House and started stirring the races up against each other? Why is it that we weren't hearing about all these grievances until he came along? Tell me that. Can you explain that to me? Do you think it's helpful? Do you think it's helpful to, to call thugs, uh, to tell them that they're justified in burning a city down? No. No. Well, that's my whole point. He's not doing any community any good by, by saying, oh, well, I understand their rage and those evil police are the reason. That's after police are being killed in an epidemic in America. Instead of offering a shred of sympathy for the police, he again says they're the problem. I think he's pure evil, by the way. I think that President Obama is a purely evil Machiavellian manipulator of the, of the worst kind. And he's doing all the races no good. Oh, my God. I love you, Mike Savage. <laughs> and he's doing all the races no good. And he's setting race relations back 50 years, not forward. We don't want to go back. No, nobody wants to go back. I've had black teachers who were the best teachers I ha ever had in my life in the seventh grade. I had a black math teacher. Loved him. I didn't care. I had a Chinese teacher I loved. Loved her. I didn't care what the race was. You know, I wrote a book years ago. You know what I said in it? Without quality, there can be no equality. I think it's one of the best lines I've ever, ever written. Without quality, there can be no equality. Let me please have you accept a free copy of of my brilliant new novel, Countdown to Mecca. I hope you enjoy it. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. So back. Have a joint. Uh, Boys who smoke cannabis before puberty could be stunting their growth by more than four inches, a new study suggests. Researchers found that youngsters who were addicted to the drug were far shorter than their non-smoking peers. They discovered that rather than being a relaxing pastime, smoking dope actually makes the body more stressed in the long term. The study was uh, done in Pakistan. I guess they're evildoers over there. And they said that the levels of certain hormones involved in growth and puberty in the blood of 220 non-smoking and 217 cannabis-addicted boys were studied, et cetera. You can read it yourself. 
Super strong cannabis responsible for a quarter of psychosis cases. You ask emergency room doctors today what they're seeing. Ask them if they're seeing an increase or a decrease in the number of people who are coming in in a state of panic. Overt psychotic breaks from marijuana. You'll hear that there's an epidemic of psychotic episodes from the use of cannabis because many of you are older people. You think that a joint is kind of a, a little mild, little herb kind of thing. This dope is 17 to 25 or 30 times stronger than the dope you smoked in the 1960s. Cannabis use shrinks and rewires the brain. Even the casual use of cannabis alters the brain. Cannabis is highly addictive, according to every study. So let me repeat again. The cannabinoids in marijuana can be miraculous for medical use. But smoking marijuana or using any form of cannabis, even a water pipe or whatever, is a different story. Buyer beware. Caveat and poor. Live and learn. If you don't believe me, just Google or search for yourself in three minutes. Toxins found in marijuana smoke. You'll find out that marijuana smoke is more toxic in many ways than tobacco smoke. Okay? Have a nice high. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. We have breaking news on the Savage Nation in hour number three. Get ready to get out your uh, crying handkerchief. Louisiana Religious Liberty Bill goes down in defeat as Republicans side with LGBT activists. You heard me. Louisiana Republican lawmakers sided with Democrats, big business, and LGBT activists to kill a bill that would have protected individuals and religious institutions opposed to same-sex marriage. In doing so, the Republican lawmakers defied the objections of an overwhelmingly majority of voters and handed Governor Bobby Jindal a major defeat for his legislative agenda. A House Legal Committee voted 10 to 2 today to shelve the Louisiana Marriage and Conscience Act, a marriage the critics said could sanction discrimination against same-sex couples. However, the proposed law clearly stated the opposite. They said its sole purpose was to prevent the government from discriminating against a person or a nonprofit because of their support for traditional marriage. So you heard it first on the Savage Nation. The bill was strong-armed by corporations, and I have to tell you their names. They kowtowed to IBM, which is building a technology job center in Baton Rouge. An IBM executive penned a letter to the Times-Picayune warning that, quote, IBM will find it much harder to attract talent to Louisiana if this bill is passed and enacted into law. They catered to the gay and lesbian and transgender and tricycle committee. And so instead of protecting the citizens, they protected IBM. It's unbelievable to me. Jindal scoffed at such threats in April when he wrote an op-ed published in the New York Times where he said, I have a clear message for any corporation that contemplates bullying our state. Save your breath. He said he would not be deterred by corporations that were pressured by radical liberals, Jindal wrote. Nevertheless, Louisiana voters just got punched in the guts. Republicans sold the state out. They bought into the lies and distortions propagated by activists and big business. It was not really to be expected what happened. But I will tell you, I will see a day when Christian churches will lose their tax-exempt status and Christian schools will lose their accreditation. I will see a day in this country, if this keeps up, when those who refuse to endorse homosexual marriage will be prohibited from practicing their profession. That's what I see coming in the United States of this America. I'm Michael Savage, and I believe in my position. Now let's go on to the callers. Gianna, Gianna, Gianna on WABC. What's on your mind, Gianna? Hi. Um, so I'm 12 years old, which means that I'm in sixth grade, and we had to do a project about a courageous person. I chose you, and my teacher told me not once but twice that she was unhappy with my decision, but of course you promoted gay rights activists and Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. 
But she tried to convince me that you were inspirational instead of courageous, but I stuck with you. She said I was what? She said that you were inspirational over courageous. Oh, but she didn't put me down. No. How, 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 do, you dif how, do, you, how do you separate inf inspirational from courageous? I don't see how you can separate the two. But, John, thanks. Stay on the line. I'll send you a copy of my new novel. I'm sure you can read it. Countdown to Mecca. 855 is the phone number. Let's move on to the, to the big topic of military arms for police. Daniel on WMAL, fire away. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Michael. Uh, at the end of the day, I listen to your sardonic wit, and you make my day. Uh, things are so exasperated uh, psychologically where I live. You're great. Thank you. Keep it up. Uh, military. Uh, I don't believe they should have, uh, pardon me, the local police should not have any sort of military-type weapons. They should be kept with the military. Local police should be local. Uh, answerable to the local population. Well, I understand the argument from both sides, but after seeing what happened in Baltimore, uh, where the police were disarmed by the state prosecutor who sent them in without helmets and without body armor, they became powerless. How would our local police protect themselves from gangs armed with AK-47s unless they have armored personnel carriers, for example? Now, I understand that many people on the patriotic side are afraid of a militarized local police a force or forces because they fear that they could be turned against patriots. I understand. Is that where you're coming from? Uh, yes, sir. But also, also, there's 150 million, at least 100 million people who are armed to the teeth. Many of them are lower middle class people who work hard, pay their taxes, never been in trouble with the law. They know how to use their firearms. They can easily be deputized. Why this never has been done before? Well, deput wait, deputized by whom? Pardon? Whoever needs them. Instead of yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of hocum pocum out there. I see it on the internet. Every time something happens, the trolls go out and say everyone should carry if they had guns. You know, it's easy to say that, but getting in a shootout is a little different than shooting your mouth off uh, uh, on the internet. And so I'm, I'm not so sure that the average citizen can be deputized and be useful in anything, frankly. I don't know that they'd be useful for anything whatsoever. Many people who have guns don't even know how to shoot them. And number two, I think that they could hurt themselves more than hurt the bad guy. So I'm not into deputizing uh, the average citizen. I believe the police are highly skilled and highly trained for a good reason. Because when that time comes for them to pull that gun, they have a split second to make a decision in which not only is their life at stake, but the life of others. And it's only because of this incessant target practice that the police are forced to go through that they often do kill the bad guy first. And I don't think the average citizen uh, is at all capable of getting involved in such a, uh, a, a, a shootout with bad people, period. End of story. 855-407-282. Let's go to KSFO Radio in my hometown of San Francisco. Line number seven, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Daryl, are you there? I'm, good. I'm here. I, uh, I was calling about the marijuana uh, comments. However, the last caller makes me want to talk about that since I'm a police officer and a patriot. Well, go either topic, just fire away as quickly as you can. Well, one of the arguments is uh, police, you know, patriots don't want the uh, police to be militarized. Well, I'm a police officer and a patriot. I'm a Gadsden waving police officer who believes in the Second Amendment and would never take away someone's guns without due cause. Uh, I would be the first one to stand up against anyone trying to do that, even as a police officer. So that that justification there, that argument doesn't work for me. But, so wait, are you are you for or against what Obama did yesterday with the stroke of a pen taking away military equipment from local police? I thought it was outrageous for him to do that in light of what happened in Baltimore uh, and Ferguson. I think the police need military weaponry, especially since the gangs are so heavily armed. Do you agree or disagree with that? I agree, and they're not. It's not military weaponry. It's it's an armored vehicle that's used to protect us. It's a you know, 37 or 40 millimeter launcher that's used for gas deployment or less lethal beanbags. It's not a tank. It's not a bomb. The so why would Obama do this other than to weaken the police in America? You know that that's what he did it for. Absolutely. He did it only to weaken local police because there's a movement within his cadre of hardcore communists 
to nationalize the police force and turn them, in, them into one corrupt, gigantic federal police force along the lines of the corrupt Mexican federales. And if that's what you want in America, that's what this gang is trying to achieve. Make no mistake about it. This is a criminal administration. And by coming down against military equipment for local police, he's doing that for one reason only. And that's to weaken the local police and strengthen the idea of a national police force. That is my ass assessment. And we would never stand for that, Michael. As, as a local police officer, we would never allow anyone to come in and take over our country like that. Let me explain something. I have in my family members of the uh, police. And uh, one of them went to Germany a few years ago on a vacation, young guy. And he went and studied the rise of Nazism and especially how they came to power despite the fact that most police in Germany hated the Nazis. They don't, people don't know that. Most of the police in Germany were not Nazis. They hated the Nazis initially. But through a series of events, Hitler and his mad, brilliant genius was able to co-opt local police like you, step by step, bill by bill, uh, and eventually turn the local police into Nazis who did his bidding from a national or federal level. Any police who opposed them were thrown into concentration camps. So it's not as easy as saying you wouldn't do it. There are powers that a madman can use that are awesome. And you should be aware that this madman is starting that process of deballing the local police in America. How far it will go is anyone's guess. It is very worrisome, though, as far as I'm concerned. And I want you to keep us informed so that never happens. No, and you know what? I think that I owe it to my audience since I initiated this topic to show you step by step how Hitler co-opted the police in Germany who opposed them initially in the early 30s because it was done step by step. My good friend, I'll send you a copy of Countdown to Mecca. It did very, very well the first week. I got the uh, first results from uh, my publisher. I ask all of my audience to please use social media to send out a tweet or whatever you do and tell them to go to any local bookstore and demand to see Countdown to Mecca right up front where it is supposed to be. That brings us to 44 minutes after the hour. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. We have covered a lot of topics today, very political, and uh, apparently the uh, potheads won't give up on the marijuana issue. Paul, on KSFO, make your point. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Michael. I've been smoking pot for like five zero fifty 50 years. Uh, I don't think it's rotted my brain any. Uh, I'm the author of five uh, scholarly nonfiction books uh, that are in college. I understand. So that means you're an intelligent man. So would you listen to reason and the evidence or not? Uh, yeah, well, I have not looked at the evidence uh, concerning uh, the uh, carcinogens in, uh, in uh, marijuana smoke. I will uh, definitely take a look at that. Well, let me give you a short version. If you compare, as researchers have done, marijuana smoke with tobacco smoke, you will find that several toxic compounds, including ammonia and hydro hydrogen cyanide, are at higher levels than in tobacco smoke. For example, ammonia levels were 20 times higher in the marijuana smoke than in, th in the tobacco smoke, while HCN, nitric oxide, and certain aromatic amines occurred at levels three to five times higher in the marijuana smoke. So this is not an ethical or a moral issue, it's a medical issue. But aside from that, I want to make my position quite clear. I'm against incarcerating people for using marijuana. I'm against the legalization of marijuana because it sends the wrong message to children. Uh, and also, scientists who know this field very well, including the genius of geniuses, Raphael Mishulam and Hebrew University, if you want to research what he has to say, agrees with this position because he said it has very damaging effects on developing brains. So you yourself may be, let us say, capable of ingesting marijuana very successfully and, and thinking very clearly, but that doesn't apply to everybody, Paul. There are people, for example, who can eat junk diets, smoke and drink, and live to 95. Most of us can't. You just may have the genetics uh, to be different, Paul. Yes, uh, but uh, let me just make uh, one more point. Um, it's possible to uh, eat cannabis, to take it orally, 
okay, in which you will avoid uh, all of these. Uh, yeah, I understand that. I'm talking about marijuana smoke, but again, we go back to the difference between recreational use of cannabis as opposed to the medicinal use of cannabinoids. I'm totally in favor of the miracles that are being, this, the miraculous cures that are being reported from various cannabinoids and various illnesses, but I still believe that marijuana smoke or marijuana itself, whether it's smoke or not smoke, damages the thinking and damages the brain. Obviously not in your case. I might be the exception that proves the rule. Uh, and th thank you, by the way, for your uh, enlightened... Um, uh, We're not arguing. We're really discussing. That is the difference between educated people and uh, uneducated people, I think, Paul. Let me send you... I wish I could send you a, a report on this, but you could research this. I'm going to send you my novel, which I'm sure when you're stoned, you'll enjoy reading Countdown to Mecca. Apparently, it's better on marijuana than, uh, than on alcohol. Uh, actually, when you think about it, you know, you can't even read when you're drunk. When you think about that one. Marijuana, people who smoke dub generally read more, I think. Am I mistaken about that? I don't know whether they watch cartoons or read books. But there's no question in my mind that people who drink alcohol generally don't read books. No question about that one. Uh, yeah. Now, the militarized police issue. Obama took away certain equipment from the police. Listen to clip five. It's a very important one. It's only 30 seconds. Listen carefully. Today, we're also releasing new policies on the military style equipment that the federal government uh, has in the past provided to state and local law enforcement agencies. You know, we've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like there's an occupying force as opposed to uh, a force people. That's you mean rabble? That's protecting them and serving. What a lying alienate snake! And intimidate local residents. Ah, oh, come on with the alienation! You alienate this country every day when you open your filthy made trap. For the battlefield that is not appropriate for local police departments. What would you know about the battlefield? Tell me what you know about the battlefield with ISIS raging through the Middle East. An expert now on the battlefield. He was golfing while ISIS was taking another city. Your commander in chief, that phony. You want your cops going out with those animals in the streets with machine guns, with no equipment and no armored personnel carriers? Why don't you go out there, all you good liberals? You idiots, you, you morons, as you're city burning, you're sitting here supporting the animals who are burning your cities down, and you're attacking the police who would protect you, you stupid idiots. That's a product of 20 years of pot smoking and reading the wrong books. Why don't you put down your red brigades and pick up your red, white, and blue? Idiots, morons! Steven, on WBRB, you'll have the last word in the Savage Nation. Fire away. How you doing, Dr. Savage? I just like to, I'm an inner city police officer here in Jacksonville. And I like to comment on the uh, militarization of the police. Liberals have it all wrong. We don't drive around here in tanks and armored car carriers on every call that we go to. Those the, the armored carriers, they're, they're used for certain situations like in Baltimore and Ferguson. Like they should be used. What I would be more concerned with... That the Obama didn't seem to care when cops were getting killed over the last few weeks because of his filthy rhetoric and him of Al Sharpton and, and Eric Holder. There's an epidemic of cop killings because of these gangsters. I agree. I would be more concerned that they're not allowing the local police to handle local issues and they're having military presence. Uh, well, what's more concerning, the police doing their job protecting people or having the military standing by? That's what I'm saying. Obama is right now running the jade exercise in Texas. It was over a few days ago of putting Marines inside American towns and cities and practicing interning civilians who are opposed to the government. At the same time, he is defanging the local police. You put two and two together and you may come up with A-D-O-L-P-H. I'm Michael Savage. Thanks for listening.